series round two once again. Uh, I hate to say this, but we've never, if you're a veteran, we've never missed more than one day due to snow, and we've never missed two until this year. So anyway, so I guess if we're going to do it, um, we're going to do it. So tonight, I hope we have something that you guys will find um, a little interesting, and that is the history of the continent of Africa. And it's big. Um, so we're going to kind of go counterclockwise. And Africa has this long, very rich history that a lot of history classes never really touch on it because, like, why would you, I guess? Well, that is kind of short selling what happens. And, <clears throat> uh, excuse me here, um, while Europe is in the so called Dark Ages, Africa is doing incredible, wonderful things all over. But the big problem, one of the reasons why a lot of historians skip Africa, is for hundreds if not thousands of years, the history was all oral. A lot of their cultures didn't write anything down because they didn't need to. After Egypt, we don't really see a lot of written descriptions until Rome, and after that, it's not until the Islamic traders. So a lot of it is pieced together, but I hope you find it interesting. I do. I was fortunate uh, many years ago in a former life, I got to spend time in what is now Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and I got to spend a little bit of time in the capital of Harare, and six weeks out living in a Neolithic village called Songwe Village by Victoria Falls, and I brought in some artifacts for everyone to check out today. So, um, Africa. Uh, it's kind of funny because when Europe goes into the Dark Ages, people forget about Africa. Well, as I joke with the students, Africa is a continent of which there are seven. Right? It is not a country. There's a whole bunch of countries in, in Africa. And it takes up 20% of the world's landmass, a fifth, so it's really big. And because of its size and its different geography, there's a lot of internal diversity, linguistic, <coughs> cultural, religious. And Africa, as a continent, has all these unique climate zones. Two of the big ones we're going to talk about is the big um, Sahara Desert. We know up here in northern Africa, and it is important because it had one of the links of the Silk Road known as the Trans-Sahara Trade Route where a lot of gold and salt was imported and exported. And then, especially on the east coast, kind of the middle into the south, we have the rich savanna grasslands. And the best way I can describe the savanna grasslands is when your kids were small, you probably had to watch the movie The Lion, the Lion King, so you know. <laughs> Okay, Simba and Nala. Well, that is a savanna, like the great Serengeti plain over here in um, Tanzania. And the geography plays a large role in Africa, where people can settle and where they can live. And so one of the big things people always talk about are the great Bantu migrations. Oftentimes, People explain it as the Bantu migration singular. Well, it wasn't singular. There were many migrations over, <coughs> excuse me, a thousand year period. And Bantu is a root language, like, like Latin is for the, the European world. And the Bantu speakers will start over here on the west coast and kind of move down at a 45 degree angle and then go straight south. And the Bantu are very important for a couple reasons. Number one, as they migrated, they were herders. So they were looking for pasture land for all of their crops, animals. But they had a unique skill. They understood iron making. So a lot of their tools, a lot of their weapons were made of iron. So they were much militarily stronger than everybody else. So when they came up to you, you had three choices. You could either disperse and find somewhere else to live. You could be assimilated by the Bantu speakers, like the old, any Star Trek fans, uh, the board, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. All right. Or they would just simply kill you. All right. So you have choice A, B, or C. But as they moved, they spread their language root, 
and their iron making technology and their irrigation techniques, bringing water to pasture land. So they have a great impact on Central and Southern Africa. The other language dialect is Swahili, Santa Sana, everyone. And Swahili will grow over here, like Kenya, you know, Tanzania, a little bit of, you know, Somalia. And it is a blending of African and Arabic. It is the second biggest root language in Africa, which will be very important with Indian Ocean trade. We're going to talk about it later on. So here's the great Bantu migrations. And the Swahili, those are the two big root language dialects that go on in Africa. But we're going to start <coughs> way up in the upper right-hand corner, just after the great heyday of ancient Egypt, we get the kingdom of Nubia or Cush. And if you read some of the descriptions in the Old Testament, King Solomon is often trading with people in Nubia and Cush. You know, Moses and Ramses and the guys were knew about the people in Nubia. And it is directly south of Egypt, kind of the middle part of the Nile River. And so they've been around for a long time, and they built a capital, um, and their architecture is very Egyptian. You can see, kind of, there's a miniature of the Giza Plain out here, and the capital was known as Moro. It's also known as the Moroic Dynasty or Empire. And they had frequent interactions. They were either at war with ancient Egypt, in which they normally lost, or they were trading with ancient Egypt. So a, like a love-hate relationship, you know, food, grain, and cotton for things that we have. And they were embattled with the Egyptians because of their control of the middle of the Nile River. The Egyptians wanted the control of it, and the Nubians had it. And they are able to fend off Egypt, even though Egypt is bigger and stronger. They got um, quality ironwork way before Egypt did. Egypt, for a long time, their strongest metal was copper. And when a copper sword meets an iron sword, the iron sword is going to win. So they were smaller, but their weapon technology, their metal technology, was much, much better. They will eventually be absorbed into a very powerful, very interesting kingdom known as Axum. And if you forget, here's my here's history joke of the night, you can always ask them a question. Yeah. Um, okay, all right, let's see if you guys will have a pulse tonight. Okay, there we go. So anyway, all right. So Axum will become a full-blown empire between 100 or like, you know, zero, first century to the 7th century A.D., so think of the growth, the heyday of the Roman Empire to the heart of the Middle Ages. This is the darkness of the European Middle Ages. And it was located in what is today um, Ethiopia, right on the east coast of Africa, very close to the Arabian Peninsula. And it is going to become powerful because it is one of the bookends of the great Trans-Sahara trade route. Things that traveled on this route were gold and salt. And in the ancient world, we'll see here in a second, salt was worth more than gold. It was the ancient world's refrigerator. <coughs> how to preserve your meat, how to preserve your fish. People actually paid their taxes, and soldiers had their salaries paid in salt. It was very valuable. If you got salt, you have life. So it left Axum for the Middle East, along with... African minerals, gems, and um, the slave trade, which we're going to talk about. And so Axum connects Africa to the ancient Middle East known as the crossroads of the world, where Europe, Asia, and Africa all kind of meet. It was in this nexus, this trading center. And much like their cousins over in the Arabian Peninsula, the um, Axumites and the Arabs were merchants and traders. Everybody knew them because they were, you know, passing goods back and forth between the three continents. So they were very comfortable. Many people in Axum spoke three, four, or five languages because they were in the trading business. And you had to know who to talk to to get the best price. They export everything from animals to ivory to gold to salt to slaves. 
And we know a lot about them because being close to Egypt and then Rome, they're one of the few groups that actually wrote stuff down. And they made all these inscriptions on these giant obelisk-like pyramids. And also, because of their trading, everybody else wrote about them. The Romans wrote about them. Alexander the Great um, people wrote about them. Byzantines wrote about them. And Muslims wrote about them. So Axon was around. They were a mover and a shaker. And as such, and all the conflicts and the violence in the region, nobody really bothered Axon because they were economically necessary. If you have money and people can use you, they're not going to bother you. They're going to leave you alone. And in the 300s, we get famous King Uzana. And Uzana is very, very important. He adopts Christianity. And if you know the Roman timeline, Const Byzantine Emperor, Roman Emperor Constantine, adopted um, or converted Christianity in 313. Well, just eight years later, um, King Uzana converts to Christianity. And he creates a new kingdom um, in the area, and he burns the old Nubian, the Meroic capital, he burns it to the ground. He says, no, I don't like this. Axum Nubia, I'm going to destroy everything, and I'm going to make it uniquely my own. I'm going to Christianize this um, area. And he makes Christianity the official religion not too long, or um, he makes Christianity the official religion of his empire before it's the official religion of the Roman Empire. So that is the significance of King Azana. He also makes these beautiful churches, like the Church of St. George, that is still there to this day. Um, instead of building a church, he excavated a rock quarry and then carved the church out of the actual mountainside. And you take these steep steps down here and you go into the church from the bottom, shaped like a cross. It's still there. It's still an, an active church. And what makes it unique as you can see from the previous slide, it's right next to Saudi Arabia. So in an area that after Islam spreads, um, this Christian stronghold is able to grow once again because the people of East Africa and the Arabs had been trading them for so long. Prophet Muhammad studied with Jewish rabbi and Christian bishops. Christians were people of the book. So Christianity kind of survives this little enclave of Christianity in this greater Muslim world. Um, King Uzana also said, I'm tired of buying and selling and trading all these different weird things. Um, for money, we're going to take something we have a lot of, this yellow rock called gold, and we're going to stamp my picture in it. And it's going to be the currency that we use to buy and sell things. Now, the Romans have, had been doing this for a while. So gold becomes an, an essential currency over here in East Africa, connecting the Middle East, Africa, and some of the European um, trade routes. And, you know, his new kingdom, Axum Nubia, going back, made these wonderful obelisks called a steel, these giant stone pillars. And so on them, we can see some recorded history, and we can see a lot of their intense architecture, which they were able to build into the mountains. Another reason why Axum was left alone for a long time, their geography was very mountainous. It was hard for an invader to get to them. So they're traders, they're merchants, and their stuff is in the mountains. So we're just going to, ah, we'll go around them, we'll go underneath them, we'll go by them. But it's just too hard to go through them. Uh, and they become some of the first people in the world to start using terrorist agriculture. To grow crops, much like the ancient Inca made famous, they cut little tables, little stair steps in the sides of mountains. So when the rains came and it washed and it rained, it wouldn't swoop down the, the, the steep side of the mountain and wash away all, of, all the plants and topsoil, they stepped it down and they built vast irrigation canals to keep the soil from washing away and to water their plentiful um, crops. So a very ingenious, very vibrant empire going over on in East Africa 
uh, right alongside from ancient Egypt all the way to Rome that most people never hear about. And I love the inscription on their coin that we have in God we trust. Well, they say, may the country be satisfied. All right? We're working hard, we're trying to grow food, we're trying to keep you safe, we're trying to um, you know, um, uh, maximize our, our irrigation. So hey guys, may you be satisfied. We're doing the best we can, we're working hard, take it and like it. So, <coughs> Axum, unfortunately, we don't really know what happened. They were living on the coast, natural disaster, invaders, we don't know what but they move their capital inland. And as they do that, um, the empire begins to fall apart. Unfortunately, we haven't found the writing yet or the solution yet to what caused them to move. Was it an invader? Was it pressures? Was it economic problems? But they move, and when they move, Axum will um, collapse. They're never conquered by an outside in invader. They just kind of grow old and weak and feeble, and by 630, about the time of the Dark Ages, they just kind of, kind of fade away and will be absorbed um, by the growing spread of, of Islam three, four years later after Muhammad and Abu Bakr, still Christian, but their kingdom's power is, is gone. And so from Axum, we're going to follow the Trans-Sahara trade route over to West Africa. And I really like to talk about this area of the world. The students here laugh at me. I envision the continent of Africa kind of like a human torso. Like South Africa is right here and the Congo is like your stomach. And you go over to the right shoulder socket of West Africa. And you know, like, you know, the Mediterranean Sea would be like um, the head. And the Trans-Sahara trade route becomes all important at this time. Um, a couple weeks ago we talked about the world going on in the European Middle Ages. And so for centuries you've got the Roman Empire which connects with um, you know, uh, you know, empire on three continents. Um, it connects with the ancient Middle East. And ancient Persia and the current Sassanian Empire had this great road called the Great Royal Road. The Great Royal Road links over to ancient India and the Gupta Empire. The Gupta Empire links over to East Asia and China. So you've got these four regional empires, Rome, Sassanid, Indian, um, you know, the Han Chinese, that has this great road network we know as the Silk Road. Every 20 miles, there were water wells dug, there were fruit trees planted, and 20 miles is about the average distance a person could travel, a merchant could travel in one day. So if you were a merchant, you had a place to stay, you had water to drink, you had food to eat, you could you know, take care of your livestock. And it was all done to speed communication, trade, and your soldiers. These four regional empires locked everything down from Atlantic to Pacific. Well, now they're falling apart. Western Roman Empire has totally um, collapsed, and so its part of the Silk Road is kinked off, but everything else is still going fine. And a part that grows in power while Western Europe is in chaos is the Trans-Sahara trade route. This is because new technology was invented known as a camel saddle. All right, we think, oh, really? All right. Camels are big, strong beasts, but it's how do you balance cargo on you know, an animal that you can't reach over? Well, the camel saddle was invented. Camels are extremely durable. They can carry a pretty heavy load through this vast desert. So the Trans-Sahara trade route is going to link into the Great Silk Road. And there are two main products that will travel on it. One is gold. The other one is salt. And it will be transferred back and forth across the widest part of Africa via this road network. And it will give birth to three great West African empires, Ghana, Mali, and um, Senegal, and the um, Songhai civilization. So, gold was extremely important because now it's used as the medium of exchange. And gold is plentiful in East and West Africa. 
Miners would dig it out of the ground, and in some places, it was almost like the Aztecs of, of Mexico, we'll talk about next week, barring no snow. Yeah. Um, all right? It was just laying on the ground. All right? So they, oh, this is cool. And they would, you know, kind of melt it down or whittle it down, and they would pack it in feather quills to keep it safe um, in um, transportation. And it would go to travel markets in North Africa with ancient Carthage, Rome, on over to um, Egypt and the Middle East. But what becomes more powerful and vibrant than gold are these giant blocks of North African salt. It kind of looks like marble or stone slabs. These are just giant wedges of salt that are just carved out of the earth and um, transported. When I was in the third grade, our field trip, up near Cleveland, we went to a Morton <coughs> salt mine, like a half mile down below Lake Erie, and they're cutting the salt out in these big stone slabs. Well, in the hot desert, you not only needed to preserve your food, but to keep people safe from dehydration in these hot tropical areas. Think of like Gatorade and, and any old athletes, remember back when we were playing, when you were thirsty, your coach said, hey, take a to take a salt pill, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, all right. How far? No wonder we're all like weird. No. <laughs> anyway, so um, and so while salt was found um, in, in the desert, it was much harder to find farther south. So people, um, not only in Arabia but in Central Africa, would give you whatever you wanted in place of salt. And remember, uh, going back a little bit. When ancient Rome defeated Carthage, they literally dumped millions, if not billions, of dollars of salt on the furrows on the farming fields outside of their rival Carthage for two reasons. One, to make sure the Carthaginians couldn't grow their crops, but to send a message. We're Rome. We're willing to waste billions of essential dollars just because we can. Mess with us. And this is what happens to you. That's how precious it was. It was more of a statement than it was, we're going to you know, let the Sahara Desert encroach on, on, on Carthage. And so a block of salt was literally worth more than its weight in gold at the time. And that is where the empire of Ghana is going to get its start. Ghana is over here in West Africa, much farther north than modern day Ghana. And it is the grandfather, it is the foundational empire of all the West African civilizations to come after it. I call them the Mayas uh, of Africa. As you know, the Aztecs and everyone else will build on what, what the Maya did. It's ancient Ghana. And they command the western edge of the Trans-Sahara trade route right here, and also a north-south trade route going through West Africa. They met at an intersection. Very coincidentally similar to the Incan capital, capital of Cusco in the ancient Incan Empire. It's right on the trade routes. It's an intersection. So we're going to put our civilization right here. Its location is also right near the great Niger and Senegal rivers. So it's got access to trade routes and it's got plentiful water near it. And so Ghana is going to start to grow right around three to four hundred. So it exists as a regional empire way back when Rome was still a vibrant empire. It will last all the way till 1100. So it sees in the European time frame, it sees everything from the collapse of Rome through the Middle Ages all the way up until the Crusades. Ghana is there for a long time. And one of the reasons they remain is their economy. They got money off of doing many different little things. Um, it achieves its heyday right around 800 to 1000. From the time of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne onward is when it's at its all-time full-blown height. And so as it controls the trade networks, the king is very, very interesting. The king is special for a couple reasons. Number one, while all other monarchies in the entire world were hereditary monarchs, meaning father passes it to son or to oldest child, in Ghana it didn't happen that way. 
the Ghanaian kings were seen as blessed by the gods. And in their polytheistic beliefs at the time, the earth, Mother Earth, was the number one goddess. From Mother Earth, all things come. So when the king died, his son didn't replace him. It was the oldest male relative of his closest female relative, normally his sister or a cousin. So it's the king's nephew who would inherit the throne. The king, blessed by the gods, came from a matrilineal or a female line, not father to son. That's one little interesting thing about the king of Ghana. Number two, he was supposed to be like the supreme judge for his people. So while like European monarchs and Asian monarchs were in their castles and palaces far removed, they would actually build a little um, pavilion, and the king would sit outside, he had his attendants, and his people would come up and speak to him. Hey, is this my chicken or is it Mark's? Um, this is so-and-so owns the rights to the water well, not this individual. And the king gave a ruling. He listened to both sides and he made the call. And so for, from the richest noble to the poorest peasant had direct access to their king. Nobody else did that. His job was to act as the ruler or the judge over them. He was supported by a council of, of elders um, old people, both men and women, experienced, and they've been around, they kind of know things. And then he had an elaborate ministry to carry out his orders. They had to take care of the taxation and the governance because he was interacting with his people on a, a daily basis. So, the king um, is in contact with his people, number one. Number two... He controlled all of the goods that were exported from his country, his empire. And anything that came in had to, be, had to pay a small tariff or a tax. So he's got his own people to tax. He's got goods incoming that he taxes. And he also maintains a monopoly on a couple key things, very similar to the Han Dynasty of China. Salt, cotton, silk, and copper. Four things that everybody needs, and he rationed it. If you wanted it, you had to go to the king. You had to pay him for it. And the last way he got money is he controlled this rich soil and these crops on either side of the Niger and Senegal rivers. And at this time, this is going to become kind of funny, a new crop comes into West Africa from Southeast Asia and Madagascar, and it is the wonderful fruit of the banana. Right? Banana comes over, you know, potassium, protein, and bananas grow like gangbusters in West Africa. So all of a sudden, there's a bunch more food, and we find different ways to um, prepare it. And the other thing, kind of your cereal in the morning, you know, cornflakes are great, but man, they're like wet like, you know, um, you, know, uh, you know, wallpaper paste. So you put a little banana on it, and when your wife's not looking, put a little bit of sugar on there, all right? You, you, you kind of get a little bit of flavor. Bill, you're fat. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, so um, next to the bananas, sugar cane grew very well. Now, if you've ever been down in a sugar cane, have you ever been in a sugar cane view? All right, all right, all right. It's kind of cool for like five minutes, and you're like, oh, it's swampy, and it's humid, and there's mosquitoes everywhere, and this, this stinks, so, all right, all right. And we're not down there with a the sickle, chopping it and drawing the dry, you know, sugar cane out, getting all cut up. I'm not going to do that. I need to find somebody that's going to do that for me. So Ghana will begin to rent their rich agricultural land. If you want to go down there and do that nasty work, go for it. But you're going to pay me a tax. And so Ghana becomes wealthy because they've got several sources of money coming in. A diversified portfolio, if you will, allows them to grow very, very rich and very, very powerful. And part of the old 
Ghanaian Empire, their stuff was so well made in parts of West Africa that it's difficult for us to go to now because of problems. You can still see their original shelters from 8, 900 are still there um, being used to this um, very day. And Islam is going to make its way over. Islam is going to have a significant impact on West Africa starting with Ghana. If they're trading gold and salt back and forth the Trans-Sahara trade route during this time frame, well by 650, 670, Islam is making its way across North Africa. So they're going to run into each other. And so Muslim merchants are going to come in and settle. And they bring their religion and their culture with them. A lot of the kings of Ghana do not convert. Um, they stick with their old polytheistic or even animistic religion. But they make elaborate arrangements um, for the Islamic traders. What can we do to help you? What can we do to help business flow? And a lot of the Islamic merchants will set up shop, and around um, 900 to 1,000, a lot of the Muslims begin to stay in West Africa, and they bring this great thing known as literacy. Um, the people of Ghana existed on this rich oral tradition. Well, we don't need to write it down because, well, I'll just tell you what I, I need you to do. And when the Muslims came with their, their records and their writing and their mathematics, kings of Ghana were like, hey, I think we could use that right here. So Muslims become educators and they become advisors and even court of officials around 1050, 1100. But they also bring a negative. Uh, we're going to talk about the slave trade in here, and we think about it, the, hor the horrific middle passage, the transatlantic slave trade. Well, by 900, Ghana, working with the Trans-Sahara the, yeah, the trans trade route, and these Muslims began to capture their rival clans and sell them as slaves to the Muslims. So there was a very heavy Islamic slave trade starting around the year 900 going eastward, that is often not talked about. And then, because of all this trade, a group of Bedouins, kind of um, African barbarians, came in with stronger metal weapons and rudimentary cannons that made their way over from China. They're known as the Almoravids. And they're able to destroy the civilization of Ghana. They're never really able to take it over and conquer it but they disrupt it, and the empire kind of crumbles and falls. And you think, well, shoot, West Africa, you were doing pretty good. Now the Almoravids have come in. What are you going to do? Well, quicker than anybody can imagine, a group of conquered people that were subjugated by Ghana take over. And that is the great kingdom of Mali. Have a good night, Ms. Rajan. Thank you. Uh, Thank you too. Definitely. Mali um, is going to be an even bigger empire than ancient Ghana. And that is because they have a great king with an interesting story known as Sundiata. And Sundiata kind of has some similarities with good old Wayne the Conqueror I'm going to tell you guys about um, one of these days. And Mali grows like the dust has barely settled on the Almoravid destruction, and Mali pops up. They look around. And they build themselves on the foundation of Ghana. And they say, man, what are we going to do? It's a terrible joke. <laughs> right. What are we going to do? That was where I started that. I'll use that one tomorrow in class. All right. And they look around and they say, well, shoot, Ghana had everything going really good. Why don't we just do like what they did and we'll make some modifications. We'll make ourselves bigger and stronger so we can't be taken over and or captured. Great idea. So they do many of the exact same things. If it's not broke, we're sure as heck not going to fix it. And Ghana, in our time frame, will become a massive empire between 12 and 1500. So in the European time frame, it's right through the Renaissance into the age of exploration, almost synonymous with the growth of the Aztecs and the Incas over in um, the Americas. So Mali, 
Aztecs and Incas are simultaneous empires growing at the same time. And they're going to get a start by good King Sundiata, who's going to build the famous city of Timbuktu. And we talked a little bit about this today in class. Anybody's grandparent ever say, oh, I'll knock you so hard, I'll knock you all the way to Timbuktu? Yes. And, uh, okay, well, all right. Back in those days, Timbuktu was um, uh, probably awesome. King Sundiata here is a young lad, and he's built with a, born with a, excuse me, gimpy right leg. We don't know if it's some type of birth defect or whatever, and because of that, his dad was kind of really hard on him and didn't talk to him and kind of, you know, slumped him off to the side. And he's about four or five years old when a rival village, a war chief, came in and attacked Sundiata's, um, you know, palace. And in front of his eyes, his entire family is killed. They leave Sundiata alone because he's a young boy and he's got a gimpy leg and he's not a threat. And then they leave, kind of like William the Conqueror. And he goes out with um, a group of, of nobles and he's angry. And he begins to try and make himself stronger. He begins to work out with different weapons. And he becomes very, very, very good at using a bow and arrow. The other thing he became very good with was an elongated spear that had more of a sword point on it than a spear point. And he becomes um, left-handed to kind of compensate for that bad leg. He gave himself extra reach and torque. And he grows big and he grows strong and he's angry. And he's about 16, 17 years old. He goes back and he begins to hunt down the people that killed his family. And no one takes him seriously at first, and he offs three, four, or five guys, and they're like, man, this guy ain't playing. And whatever it is about him, he had that charisma that guys begin to follow him, kind of like William the Conqueror. And pretty soon, he's got a little warrior band, and they just ravage the area, and they clean house, and he declares himself Mansa, or Supreme Sacred Ruler Sundiata. So I was like, man, I'm really good at this military stuff, so why don't we just keep on going? The best way to protect ourselves from a threat is if you eliminate the threat, there is no longer a threat. So we're going to get everybody that I think is a threat, and we're going to take them out and assimilate them into our empire. And so he does. And when he's done enlarging his empire, he wants to build a capital city right in the middle so I can get everywhere at once. And he begins to build the fabled city of Timbuktu. Now, very interestingly, there's four hills. There's this, the Niger River goes in a big, like, horseshoe, like on a 45-degree angle. Right up top, there are four hills on the north side of the Niger River. And there are three hills on the south side of the Niger River. And if you look all the way around it, it's wide, broad, open, um, flat plains. And so from those hills you can see everywhere. Very similar to ancient Rome with four hills on one side of the Tiber and three on the other. So Timbuktu becomes kind of the Rome of West Africa. And this big city is built and he builds his palace here. And back then, <coughs> excuse me, it was surrounded by more like, like rainforest and, and tropical jungle than the desert wasteland it is now. But Timbuktu is this awesome multicultural city. It becomes a hub or a magnet, not only for trade, but eventually for education as well. So it was like the Athens, the Alexandria, the Rome, the Constantinople of West Africa. Anybody who was anybody came here to study. And what he does is... He has his central city in the hub, but unlike other monarchs, he wasn't a top-down central monarch. Going out like spokes from a wheel, like little satellites, the people of Mali built small Greek-like city-states. But instead of ancient Greece, when they were always at war with each other, they were unified people of Mali. You took care of your own little community, but it was more of a confederation. If you needed help, Everybody else was obligated to come and help you. If you really needed something, you went up to the central city of, of Timbuktu, and Sundiata took care of it. Now, 
Sundiata very wisely keeps up the monopolies on gold and on salt and copper and cloth and all those good things. And he's got all that rich agricultural land. And he's like, God, oh, going down there in that sugarcane field, that stinks. You doing that? I ain't doing that. No. <laughs> we can't even hire people to do it anymore. What should we do? Well, you know, those fellas over there at East Chapel Hill, I don't really like them that much. <laughs> Why don't we go see if we can conquer them and attack them? Well, what if we win? Well, we'll figure this out. So they go over to rival clans and they conquer them and they turn them into prisoners of war. In the ancient world, when you become a prisoner of war, you become a slave. They said, fellas, you're going down in the gold mine. You're going down in the sugar cane field. Well, what if we don't? Well, come here, tough guy. Everybody else, what are you going to do? We're going to the sugar cane field. All right, uh, off we go. So they're, very, they're kind of very similar to Rome or the Aztecs. We are going to build our economy off of slave labor. Problem is, they are going to organize it almost into like, you know, Southern American plantation labor, or more in effect like a, a, like a Barbados or a Caribbean island or even Brazil. And it's unfortunate that and eventually the Portuguese are going to show up. And they're going to say, hey, how do you get those guys to do all that stuff down there in the swamp? Oh, we don't, you know, they don't really have a choice. We make them do it. They're our slaves. Say, what? Can we buy some off of you? And, the, you know, King says, no, they're ours. But if you want some, we'll go, we'll go get you some. And that is, we'll talk more about in a couple weeks, how the transatlantic slave trade is going to start. The foundation was laid by the um, kingdom of Mali and um, Sundiata. So Sundiata has... Uh, his monopoly's going on, he's got his slam, slave work going on, and he introduces new crops and new irrigation techniques. And they begin to grow rice and millet. And so now we've got different grains. Under Sundiata, the population of Mali blows up and gets really big, which gives them their strength and their military power to do all of these things. And um, some of us, at least some of the older folks here, are familiar with um, Mali because their namesake comes from their main clan. All right? It was different powerful ruling families controlled those um, smaller um, satellite um, city-states. But Timbuktu was governed by the Malinke people. And the Malinkes, if you guys remember Alex Haley, University of Chicago, traced his ancestry back to Kunta Kente, in the story roots. Kunta Kente was a Malinke prince who was out trying to get a present for his little brother and unfortunately got caught by some Portuguese slave traders and eventually made it to the United States as a slave. So the Malinke people are the heart and core of the root story and Professor Haley up in um, Chicago. And so here is a little kind of you know later on artistry drawing working in a cotton field, in a, in a rice paddy, in a millet field, in sugar cane, is hard, nasty work. I'm not going to do it, so I'm going to make uh, them do it. And so Mali um, was ruled by a thing called a mansa. Mansa is king or supreme sacred ruler. Sundiata is their big number one. He gives them their empire. But the, one of the more famous is a guy named Mansa Musa. Now, Mansa Musa is an interesting guy. He comes to power in 312 and rules. Him and Sundiana both ruled for about 25 or 30 years, which at the time was an extremely long time span. They were these, you know, in you know, the West African world, they were like the, um, the Charlemagnes and the uh, Peter the Greats and the Louis XIV. They lived a really long time. And they were like great, great chess players. They could kind of see into the future. And they knew that if we do this now, it's going to reciprocate and have a positive effect 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But Mansa Musa does something that uh, he thinks is a, is a pretty good idea. Number one, he expands the empire from the Atlantic Ocean deep into Central Africa. 
and he converts to Islam. He becomes a pretty zealous Muslim, and he begins to draw up a new legal code, and he bases everything he did on the um, Quran. However, he still kept some of his African essence, like his ladies didn't have to wear veals and, and things like that, but he loved Islam, he loved the law, he loved the culture, and he decides to go on one of the five pillars of Islam known as the Hajj. To be a good Muslim, once in your life, if you are physically and financially able, you are to travel to the city of Mecca. And so Mansa Musa decides he's going to go on this Hajj. He's going to fulfill the fifth of the five pillars. So in 1324, he takes off. And his entourage is enormous. And as he travels throughout Africa, he meets other African kingdoms, other you know, Islamic scholars. And he's a rich guy. He's crazy rich. So everywhere he goes, he builds mosques. He builds madrasas, European or um, Islamic universities. He gets, you know, economic and political ties with different Muslim states, and it's awesome. And he gets to Cairo, Egypt, and he gives away so much gold that he causes massive inflation in Cairo for over a decade. And in Cairo, they had a lot of gold. He just was just—he was just crazy rich, and he was doing what he thought. I'm doing the tithe. I'm doing, <coughs> excuse me, what I'm supposed to be doing. And his entourage was sixty thousand people. So I describe that as here we are in Chapel Hill with students. We've got seventy thousand, right? I got some over here, man. I'll get you in a second. I'm sorry. Um, we got 70,000 people. That would be like all of us picking up and traveling across West Africa at one time. Not only people, but animals, food, um, you name it. He had it, and he travels with it. So much so, uh, excuse me, that if you've seen the Disney classic, the movie Aladdin, when Aladdin enters the city of Agrabah, the Disney historians use the written descriptions of what Mansa Musa had from the ostriches to the camels to the elephants, and they put that in the movie. You really can't make that stuff up. That is a written, a visual description of what Mansa Musa's Haj, um, Haj was like. So if you get a chance, pull that one up on, on YouTube and um, check it out. So 80 camels carrying as much as 300 pounds um, of, of gold. And so as he goes, he hands it out. And he goes and he goes and he goes. The only problem is that he hands out so much gold. There are these guys a little north. For several hundred years, we don't know what they were doing. But one day, a guy in Portugal got up and he was stretching with the morning sun and he's like, what the heck? What's that? What are you talking about? Well, that land right there, what land? I don't know, I looked south and there was a whole bunch of land sitting there across the water. Haven't seen it in about 600 years. And he began to sniff the air. It smells like gold. The Portuguese heard that there was some guy down there who was so rich, he was just handing out gold. They said, well, shoot, we gotta go get in on that. So while Mansa Musa is a good leader um, for his people, he will begin to attract European attention, which will change the face of African history forever. Uh, Mansa Musa is going to die, unfortunately. He's going to bring back Islamic artists, Islamic architects, and his acceptance of Islam will give it a deeper penetration into West Africa. It spreads its acceptance. But when he dies... He's one of those great men of vision that he doesn't take the time to train a successor. And like Charlemagne's idiot grandsons, there's a squabble over who's going to be the next Mansa. And a civil war breaks out, and the kingdom of Mali will break into uh, um, different various parts. And so, once again, the dust barely settles on Mali falling, fa falling and the third 
of the West African empires, the Songhai Empire is going to grow. And their first emperor is a guy named Sunni or Sony um Ali. And he makes Songhai, which didn't have as wide a territory as Ghana or Mali, but he goes almost all the way across the width of, of Africa. He builds a modern navy so he could put his men on ships and float them up and down the Niger or the Senegal River very quickly, and he put his soldiers on horses. And he goes to conquer deep into Central Africa, and you're a farmer, you're on your banana plantation, you're growing sugar cane, dudes come running out of a boat on a big giant horse, and you're there with your shovel and your rake, what are you going to do? I'm good. I, 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 what do you want me to do? You're my king. Pay your taxes. Okay, God, I'm, I'm good. He is able to conquer almost all the way across Africa, and he dies in 1492. Right as Columbus is getting ready to get lost, Sony Ali dies. And he turns his empire over, not to his son, but his second in command, a guy named Askia Muhammad al Tari. And Askia kind of has a Napoleon complex. Like, he wanted to be great, but Sony Ali was this great conqueror, and, and you know, Muhammad al Tari wanted to be this great Muslim, and he wanted to go on the Hajj, and he wanted people to remember him just like they did Mansa Musa. And so he tries and he tries and he tries to turn West Africa into this perfect Islamic state. No matter what he does, though, he can never, I'm going to create a word and go Sarah Palin here, he can never fully Islamize West Africa to his own and expectations. So I guess that's the word. Um, it is now. Um, so while he's doing that, he creates this massive trade route running. If you remember where Axum was, just below the Sahara Desert, it's another trade route. So we now have two parallel ones. The only thing about Muhammad is he was so intent on building a perfect Islamic state, he did it at the expense of his own people. He would invent Arabic Muslims and businessmen to come over, and then rather than build new houses for them, he would kick his own people out and give it to the newcomers, which makes him very unpopular um, to his own people. And so there will eventually be an attack from North um, African Bedouins with gunpowder. And when al Tari's descendants say, hey, let's go to war against them, his people said, no, man, you kicked us out of our house, you kept our business, so you're on your own. And the great Songhai Empire will collapse as well. While that is going on, it fits in simultaneously with the growing age of European exploration, which we're talking about in two weeks, I believe. And the Europeans have found their way to Africa. So, um, Muhammad al um, Eski Muhammad al Tari, Mansa Musa, um, they do these great things. All right? Europe is trapped in the um, Dark Ages. And while Europe is wallowing along, you know, you know, we know, um, you know feudalism and power of the church. West Africa is growing economically powerful. These very rich, giant, large empires, flourishing kingdoms that are so good, they begin to attract attention. And those pesky Europeans have come out of the Dark Ages through the Renaissance, and now they're going full steam ahead to find some gold. Gold equals money. Money equals power. And so the trade, the slave trade is going to pick up, changing not only the African economy, but it will impact the entire world by the time it's all done. <clears throat> and so the first place impacted, you know, Ghana, Songhai, Mali, right in here, is over here um, in a place called Senegambia, between the Senegal and the Gambia rivers. The closest place on the shoulder socket to Portugal. The Portuguese Prince Henry sails out into the Mediterranean and back and then a little farther and then back. Slowly 
getting closer to Africa and staying within sight of land the whole time. And the problem with Africa and its giant geography, it doesn't have that many deep water ports. So there's really no way to dock your ships. The Allied Army found this out in Operation Torch in, in, in World War II. So to get a place for your fleet to dock, you got to go up a river. The rivers are very big and very powerful, and it's hard to sail up, you know, river uh, water coming at you. But the Senegal and Niger, the Portuguese are able to make some penetration into Africa that way. And when they do, they begin to claim the land. They begin to work with the people. Hey, you're all good. What we need is some of your gold or some of your salt. What do you want for it? We got these things eventually. We got some alcohol and we got some tobacco. All right? Consumables. You're going to take a drink. You're going to take a smoke. You're going to use it up and you're going to want more. And we'll give you more. But it's going to cost, cost you. All right? And eventually that's how the slave trade gets started. And the Portuguese are able to build these forts or castles. Most of them have been destroyed, but there are a few left up as like historical, um, like um, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And so what you would have is this dark trench leading to this dock right here. This is one still in uh, the area today, in Senegal today. And what you would do is you would capture rival tribesmen and turn them into slaves. And you would run them into like a, like a cattle chute or like a lineup at an amusement park. And then you would like shoot guns or get like angry and dogs barking. And the people would start running. And they would run uh, down the length of, of the castle and you would lower a door on the other side. People would see light. They're attracted to light. And they would run towards that light. This trench would be covered... People would run out of the building, down this trench, down to the dock, and there would be another door open with a little bit of light, and the people would run onto there, and what they didn't know, they were running onto a slave ship. When enough people got on, they closed the doors like clamshell shells, and away went the boat. Um, it was a very diabolical thing, built first in um, uh, the Senegal of Senegambia, and this is one of the few that remains to this day. There was a couple years ago, there was the, a show, I've always wanted to go on it, called The Amazing Race. And, um, and in The Amazing Race, one of the final destinations was this building, one of the ancient slave forts. And the couple that made it were African American. And the lady finished, and she started crying. And I remember his name, Phil, or whatever the, the guy is, didn't really know why she was upset. And then she s said... Well, my family is from West Africa. They may, and he was like, "Oh my God, we really." And they were embarrassed and they screwed up, and, and it was a, you know kind of a, a horrible thing. You got you got to think a little bit there, um, uh, producers. But anyway, there's not not too many of those left, um, thankfully. Um, what happens down here? You know, in this this horrible area of the world today, Liberia, Sierra Leone, with the you know blood diamonds and the child soldiers and, and all of that. Um, is new crops will be introduced from the Americas. Potatoes, corn, beans, and they grow beautiful. All right? It's like a Georgia kind of Florida climate right here, and those things grow like gangbusters. All right? Beans, corn, high in protein, it leads to a population explosion. So all these different little tribes begin to compete for territory. And while they're competing for territory in Africa, the European good old boy network, Portugal, Spain, England, France, are competing for supremacy in Europe. Well, we need land, we need money, we need power. The New World's got a lot of it. We need some slaves. And so the European powers come looking for gold. Gold brings them to Africa. Slave, slavery keeps them coming back for centuries. In the 1500s, one-third of all the people taken from Africa come from this um, era, area that is known by 
its main export, the Ivory Coast, Gold Coast, Pepper Coast, Salt Coast. They never named one the Slave Coast because every 